Thank you, Billy, for that wonderful prelude, and uh, we're looking forward to Billy leading us through our hymns this evening. It's so good to see all of you here tonight. Isn't this one of the best days we've had all year? What perfect weather, and then to top it off, a fun game. I mean, isn't it great to crush your opponent? <laughs> Just kidding, of course. I almost felt sorry uh, for Fordham today, but it was good to see the Huskers uh, uh, do well, and we hope that that can continue. And of course, uh, at least for those of us in Nebraska, it made the day even better yet, I think. So, but uh, it's again good to have you all here tonight. Uh, uh, I want to thank those who are helping with our service. First of all, thank you, Rachel, for filming. We so appreciate that. And, and then I want to thank Arla for helping with communion and Judy for helping with communion. I really appreciate their contributions. And, and then I think I'll let you look at the bulletin, really for our announcements. Uh, of course, so many things begin again uh, this coming week or really starting next Sunday, uh, uh, on this Wednesday, the youth group will begin again along with confirmation. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, choir is gonna begin again. Sunday school begin next weekend, and we're just looking forward to everything, kind of uh, uh, getting at least fairly back to normal. So we just wanna remind people of that. And then, you know, I wanna thank Mona Tanksley, uh, Rachel Weiss, you know, we've had kind of a bad week this week with our fruit. Um, as you know, it was originally delayed. By the way, we had more orders for our fruit this year than we've ever had before. Um, it's such good fruit, uh, but it had to do with trucking delays, um, just like so many other areas in life right now. They can't find enough truckers or trucks. And so originally it was gonna be delayed, but the fruit company, and I admire their integrity, the fruit company out in Washington State uh, will talk to Mona during the week. They couldn't guarantee because of the delay now that the fruit would be fresh. So they canceled it. And I think all of you have been notified if you had an order um, by Mona, Rachel, others perhaps, uh, so there will be no fruit this year. We're looking forward to next year. But I think of all the work that Mona put into this and Rachel too, let's give them a round of applause, shall we? Thank you so much. And uh, we just appreciate what everybody does here at church. But I know sometimes people go above and beyond the call of duty, as it were. And I know Mona and Rachel did so. So we really appreciate that. And uh, so but we'll look forward to next year. I think as we always do, we'll begin our service tonight with a word of prayer, and then we'll continue with our opening hymn. Heavenly Father, we just simply come to you tonight, and we pray that as we worship you, your Holy Spirit will minister in our hearts, and we will leave here strengthened and refreshed in you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for this holy house and for all who offer her their worship and praise. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, you know our problems and our weaknesses better than we ourselves. In your love and by your power, help us in our confusion, and in spite of our weakness, make us firm in faith. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first reading this evening is from Isaiah, the 35th chapter. Say to those who are of a fearful heart, 
Be strong, do not fear. Here is your God. He will come with vengeance, with terrible recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the speechless sing for joy. For water shall break forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of water. Here ends our first reading. Our psalm tonight is from Psalm 146, and as always, we'll uh, read it responsively. Alleluia! Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as he lives. I will pray as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in rulers, nor in any child of earth, for there is no help in them. When they breathe their last, they return to earth, and in that day their thoughts perish. Happy are they who have the God of Jacob for their help, whose hope is in the Lord their God, who made heaven and earth, the seas and all that is in them, who keeps his promise forever who gives justice to those who are oppressed and food to those who hunger. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord cares for the stranger. He sustains the orphan and widow, but frustrates the way of the wicked. The Lord shall reign forever. Your God, O Zion, throughout all generations. Alleluia. Here ends our song. Our gospel reading tonight is from Mark, the seventh chapter. Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know that he was there. Yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For saying that you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went by way of Sidon toward the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. They brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. He took him aside in private, away from the crowd, and put his fingers into his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Epatha, that is, be opened. And immediately his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one. But the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. Here ends our gospel reading. And just a brief note before we have our prayer, I'm, I'm trying to speak a little more loudly tonight, uh, and I know we've had a few that maybe have a hard time hearing. Uh, we may need to go to a microphone on Saturday night. It, it's a little hard to do with a mic because we need to go up and calibrate it upstairs, make sure it's the right volume, but, but if, if you're not hearing tonight, let me know after the service and we'll try and work something out, meaning we'll maybe try and make sure we have a mic and things are calibrated up there okay. But uh, So uh, I'd appreciate your feedback at the end of the service. If you've heard me uh, at least well enough tonight, let me know. But I'm trying to make a conscious effort to speak just a more loudly tonight as we go through our service. But let's, uh, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we just simply come to this evening. And we praise you for our passage from Mark. 
that we know through your Holy Spirit, you inspired Mark to remember and to record about some miracles of Jesus. And we pray that as we meditate upon them tonight, you will work some miracles in our hearts and we will leave here changed, filled with fresh hope and a knowledge that we can bring everything to you and leave all our burdens at your feet. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, all of you know I was here last week, and maybe not all of you know that I wasn't here during the week. Uh, on Tuesday, Jack and I went up to Minneapolis to see my mom, happened to see my sister also, one of my sisters, um, and then we came back Friday, got back last evening, and just had a nice time, a wonderful time. One of the days we were up there, we went to the Minnesota State Fair, and I'm so glad we did. Uh, first of all, because we ran into a friend of mine that I had not seen in 35 years, and a friend from church, and, and we had such a nice conversation. And I'm so glad he recognized me because I hadn't spotted him. We were in the horticultural building. My sister Faith and I were looking at some Christmas trees, uh, you know, that had been entered for their beauty and perfection and so on, and received ribbons and so on. Faith had just, or my sister, my Jackie had decided she was just going to sit on a bench for a while, so she was just outside the building. And, but of all things, he recognized my voice. <laughs> and, and then he turned and he saw me, which, by the way, reminded me that we all have distinct voices, don't we? Uh, probably like our fingerprints. And it also makes me think of a verse where Jesus would say, my sheep know my voice. My sheep know my voice, I call them by name and they follow me. So isn't it neat that God has given us all distinct and different voices and, and I know I've had his experience before also where maybe I was facing one direction but I heard someone else's voice behind me and I knew who it was or knew who it would be. That's happened to me many times in life. Uh, but we had such a great visit, visit. It made me nostalgic a little bit uh, for the old days in my life, as it were, which I love the present. Uh, but it made me think that I have been remiss in staying in touch with some of my friends. And, and I kind of made a secret promise to myself that I was going to try and get back in touch with some of these old acquaintances and some of these old friends, if nothing else, to send a greeting to them on Facebook. I have another friend in mind, and uh, people are precious, aren't they? And, and I, I felt a little bit guilty for allowing uh, a friend, an acquaintance from church, to, to have that lapse over all these years. But it was fun to catch up with him a little bit. and. Of course, I shared a little bit about my life and everything else, but uh, so I enjoyed that. But then, of course, we just simply enjoyed the fair. Uh, wonderfully, maybe my, one of the favorite things we did is we went to the North Country. Uh, it's a timber area in the fair. We saw a great show uh, where two guys climbed tall poles. They raced to the top. I don't think you could have paid me to do it. <laughs> These same two guys would see who could cut through a log most quickly. Uh, there were two women, loggers as it were, and they did the log rolls and see who could roll each other off. And, and then they had a hatchet throw uh, and did a contest that way. I really kind of enjoyed it. Before that was a dog show. I know we were in the dairy building at one point, and for the first time in all my years going to the fair, which, again, there's been quite an interval uh, in Minnesota, one a few years ago, but then it had been probably 25 years. Um, for the first time, we saw one of the dairy princesses uh, having her sculpture done. And I don't, it's been enough years, I don't know if they do this in Nebraska or not anymore, I don't remember. But in Minnesota, they have a royal court of dairy princesses. And of course, ultimately there's a queen, but someone who's really gifted in doing sculpture does their bust, their face, out of butter. And they start with a 40 pound slab of butter. And I've never seen it done before. We've just seen the end products. <laughs> and, and anyway, so this princess was sitting on a stool. She had her little crown on. 
had a winter coat because it's 40 degrees in there in the fridge where they do it, the glass enclosed refrigerator. And the guy had winter clothing on and he was, he was doing her sculpture. It's kind of fun. And my understanding is they all get to keep these 40 pound slabs of a sculpture. And this is what I found kind of intriguing and a little bit surprising. They even get to keep the scrapings. <laughs> I guess if you want to put them all together and melt them into a ball, whatever. But the whole 40 pound slab is yours if you're a princess, even what they shaved off your sculpture. Uh, but anyway, I enjoyed seeing that. Went to what used to be Machinery Hill as a kid. My dad grew up on a farm, we'd always go there. Oh, they had a John Deere exhibit, mostly lawnmowers now, one big tractor, it was it. Uh, they had a Kubota. Now it's mostly cars and SUVs that dealers bring in to look at. Of course, I had to look at some of those. You always dream, right? And uh, so went to that and just, just had a good time seeing so many things at the fair. We went to some of the animal barns. Um, and then, of course, sampled the food. Is there anybody who doesn't like fair food? <laughs> Footlong hot dogs, uh, pronto pups. My sister got a brat, and I so envied her because I couldn't bring myself to get one because they can bother my stomach. But one stand had like six different types of brats. And one was even called the Minnesota brat because it had wild rice in it, along with jalapeno cheese. I knew that would be dangerous. Um, but anyway, lots of great stuff. Cookies. Usually there's things like funnel cakes. I didn't see those. I know there's donuts. Um, I had a pronto pup. Uh, there were milkshakes. Oh, by the way, I had a new variety of apple. It's just out. It's called First Kiss. Why, I don't know. I didn't think it was an extra sweet apple. It was a good apple. It was kind of tart, I thought. But maybe the first kiss sometimes is tart. Um, I have no idea. Uh, but anyway, had, a lot of, had some fair food and it's all good. I kind of think of fair food as sort of comfort food with an edge. Comfort food with an edge. And uh, I don't know where they coined the phrase comfort food, but we've all heard of it. Uh, but maybe you've had times in your life where you just wanted some comfort food. Uh, food that would just make you feel better. And you didn't care about the calories. You didn't care about the cholesterol. You just needed to eat something that would make you feel better. Kind of a reminder that sometimes in life we just want to feel better, don't we? Sometimes in life we just want to feel better. Sometimes in life we feel a need to be comforted. To experience some help in our lives. Because we feel broken. Because we live in a broken world, don't we? We live in a broken world. And sometimes as part of living in a broken world, we feel broken. And by the way, on, on a theological level, we are broken, aren't we? And one level we feel broken when we get banged up by this world and we're hurting. On another level, we're broken because we're sinful. And we need the forgiveness of Christ, and that can bring some healing to at that aspect of the brokenness of our lives. But tonight I'm going to talk about the other type of brokenness, where we just are hurting. And we want some help. And we cry out to the Lord. Kind of like the people did in our gospel reading tonight. From Mark chapter 7. Um... I'd like to point out, before we get to our points, and I'll go through the points kind of quickly tonight, but I'd like to give a little more background than I sometimes do. Uh, just things I hope you took notice of. First of all, both the people who were healed tonight in our lesson had someone represent them, right? The mother comes 
and begs Jesus to heal her daughter, to cast out a demon. Someone comes and intercedes for her, as it were, because she loved her. I mean, does anybody love someone more than their own child? Um, and we see the mother coming and interceding for her daughter. And then friends come for this other man, the man who it says was deaf and had a speech impediment. Friends come and bring him to Jesus because he couldn't speak for himself, could he? So they spoke for him. And of course, Jesus would heal him. As a bit of a side note, Jesus is not in Israel right now. He's in, he's in an area of the Decapolis or Phoenicia. He's in a Gentile area. And if you read a commentary in the Gospel of Mark, it would indicate that Jesus went there intentionally. I mean, Jesus didn't do anything by accident, did he? But he went there intentionally. And very obviously, one of those reasons would be to show the Jewish people that he was meant for the whole world. That he was meant for the whole world. And now the good news of the healing of God, the grace of God, was going out into all the world. And then he would deliberately heal two Gentile people. Interestingly, because he was in a non-Jewish area, and by the way, in Israel, they'd all know Hebrew, they'd learn it in school, they'd learn it in Shabbat school, but actually, even in Israel, the people would speak Aramaic. Jesus' primary tongue would have been Aramaic. But where he was at now, they would have spoken Greek. And Jesus would have known Greek. Now you might think, well, yes, Jesus knew Greek because he's God. He would know every language of the world. Well, I'm sure that's true. But more than likely, he would learn Greek the old-fashioned way by studying it because the Jews in Galilee, northern Israel, would have learned Greek and known it. And more than likely, he spoke to this mother in her own language, Greek. And doesn't God have a way of doing that? Coming to us and speaking to us in our own language? The language of our own heart? I love how Jesus comes to us. And he would have spoken to her in her language. Also, you could say the same for the man, even though he was deaf. His compatriots. And then, by the way, just a brief note, we're going to talk about this a little bit more in the points. But, of course, Jesus says, well, when she requests this healing, that he cast out a demon from, a, from her daughter, he says, it's not right to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. Well, look at that. It seems harsh. It seems stern. Uh, but just a side note here. Uh lest it seem harsher than it was, people had pets back then like you and me. And basically, the Greek term here would have been more like puppies. And in a sense, Jesus was saying, you know, it's not right to take the children's food and, and throw it to the puppies. And I bet you've all had a pet that you fed from the table, right? Now, maybe some of you have been really disciplined and have resisted that, but most of us have. Why? Because we, we love that pet, right? It gets to us. And But just a little bit of trivia. It's not right to take the children's food and throw it to the little cute puppies at the table. I mean, it's still, it's still a term that denotes hierarchy. We'll talk about that. But, but in a real sense, kind of interesting to take note of. Also with the man. With the girl, Jesus healed her long distance, didn't he? Jesus healed her long distance. The only long distance healing in the Gospel of Mark. The only one. 
But the man, he gets very personal. Because did you take this note? It says he took him aside privately. That's where Jesus does most of his work, isn't it? He does it in private. He does it in the private places of our own hearts. Because that's where our relationship with him is, isn't it? And Jesus took this man aside to develop a relationship with him, even though it was a brief encounter. And he brought healing to him privately. Now, interestingly, that, the exact opposite type of healing took place. The first one's long distance. The second one, you can't get more personal than this. He sticks his fingers in his ears. And then he takes some spit. Jesus takes his own spit. And he puts it on the tongue of the man. Commentary I read suggested a reminder that this healing would come directly from Jesus and be so personal and involved the exchange of spit. Interesting stuff. One final note before we get into our points, our quick points, and it's this. The word used for this man's impediment of speech, the Greek word, and I, and I didn't bother to try and remember its pronunciation or share it with you. I thought of doing that to show off just a little bit. But I thought, man, all of you will know I don't really know Greek anyway. But the Greek word here for this man's impediment of speech, it's one word. It is only used in that one place in all of the New Testament. And did you know it's only used in one place in the Old Testament? In the Greek Septuagint. By the way, the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which was written basically in Hebrew. And in about 200 BC, 70 Jewish scholars get together and they translate the Old Testament into Greek, called the Septuagint because 70 scholars were involved. And it's what the average everyday person would have often read in Jesus' time. They knew Hebrew, they'd read the Hebrew Bible, but, but for a lot of people, the more common reading translation would have been the Septuagint, even for the apostles. That would have been what they more commonly would read the Old Testament in, the Greek, the translation. By the way, if you ever come across a skeptic, and we love skeptics, they're the mission field, aren't they? We love them, God loves them, but sometimes you'll come across someone who'll say, well, you know that where it says in Matthew that a virgin will conceive and bear a son, and you should call his name Emmanuel. Well, you know, really it'll say from Isaiah, it'll say, you know what? That... In the Hebrew, in the Old Testament, it says young maiden. It doesn't say virgin. Well, young maiden meant virgin. We know that. But you know how we also know it? Because 70 Jewish scholars, 200 B.C., before Christ would ever enter the world, 200 Jewish scholars would translate the Hebrew young maiden into the Greek virgin because they knew that's what it meant. A bit of trivia if you ever run into a skeptic who you love, you pray for, and if you want to share that, you do it in gentleness and humility. But, uh, but the other place where this Greek word is used, that was used in the gospel for this man's speech minute, is in Isaiah. I believe it's Isaiah 35. The only time it's used in the Greek Septuagint and all the Old Testament, and it's the prophetic passage where it speaks of the Messiah who would unstop people's tongues or their speech impediments. And very obviously used by Mark, the writer of that gospel, 
to say. And Jesus stuck his fingers in the ears and spit on this man's tongue. He was fulfilling that prophetic passage from Isaiah 35. Neat stuff, right? Well, I apologize for having more of an introduction than I usually do. I hope some of this was as interesting to you as it was to me. But let's get down to the application for our lives. And the first point can just simply be this. As we seek, think of Jesus coming to these individuals, administering to these individuals, it's a reminder, very obvious, hopefully we've already all thought of this, is that we can bring our own brokenness and our own hurts and our own desire for healing to Jesus. We can bring it to him. We can bring everything that burdens us and lay it at his feet. Because again, this broken, fallen world has a way of sometimes snuffing all the joy out of our lives. Maybe it's finances. Maybe it's an illness. Maybe it's a loss. You know, the list could go on and on. But we can bring it to the Lord. We can bring it to him. I know it's a basic truth we all know. But isn't it great to read lesson, a lesson like this, a passage like this tonight, and be reminded of it? And maybe we come and bring it to Jesus for days and days and days and weeks and weeks and weeks and years and years and years. But we can do it. And every day we leave that heartache at the feet of Jesus. And we just say, Lord, I don't know what to do, but help me. Help me. And we can bring our brokenness to him. Um, you know, being nostalgic, thinking of a friend from 35 years ago, thinking of my upbringing in my church. You know, one of the things, and there were so many that caused me to want to follow Christ. And the primary was I wanted to go to heaven. <laughs> Pretty big deal, right? I'd be a Christian if for no other reason I want to go to heaven. I'd repent of my sins and I'd accept Christ as my Savior for no other reason. I want to go to heaven and I want to know that I'll be there. And I know that I will. I don't deserve to be there. But I know Christ has paid the penalty for my sins on the cross. And I know he said, Mark, when you're sorry for your sins and you ask me to forgive you and be your, my, your Savior and Lord, I will forgive you and I'll take you to heaven. And I claim that as a child. And there's no greater joy than living your life knowing you're going to heaven and not having to live in doubt because you've made that decision to accept Christ as your Savior. And you've repented of your sins and you've asked him to forgive you and be your Savior and Lord. But you know what? Among some of the others and way at the top of the list was, even as a boy, it brought me such peace to bring my burdens to the Lord and my worries to the Lord. And I still do it. Can I share with you when I have my devotions? 80% of my devotional prayer is still for myself. And I don't think I'm being selfish at all. Now, don't get me wrong, I pray for lots of people. But you can pray for yourself. You can pray for yourself. And I do. And we can bring our burdens to the Lord. It can lead to our second point. And that is that as we do, our faith can be strengthened. Even if our circumstance doesn't change. Our faith can be strengthened because somehow the Holy Spirit comes and reassures us. But God is there and his presence reminds us that no matter what, we won't be alone and God will be with us. And, and sometimes this interaction with Jesus can even bring out a greater faith in us. 
you know, this woman interacted with Jesus. And in one of the other Gospels where this story is told, we have these additional words. As this woman interacted with Jesus, he says, I haven't seen such faith even in all of Israel. He says, I haven't, met, I haven't even met a Jewish person who has this much faith. And they're supposed to be God's chosen people. Um, I mean, quite amazing when you think about it. Because it does seem harsh what Jesus would say to this woman. It's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the puppies or to the dogs. Ah, yes, Lord, she says. But even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. There's an interaction there. It makes me think of Jacob in the Old Testament. And Jacob, remember, he wrestles with God all night. And finally he says, I won't let you go. And at some point he realizes it's God he's wrestling with. First he thought it was a man. And then he says, I won't let you go until you bless me. I won't let you go until you bless me. And God did. Um, this interaction uh, of bringing things to the Lord, even if it's day after day after day, um, we can know. Again, sometimes our circumstances may change, but even if they don't, we can know that God is with us. And he's freshly become real to us. It can lead to our third point. And that is that as we bring our burdens to the Lord and we wrestle with him as it were, and we can do so in humility. You know, we never make demands of God. You know, we never make demands of God. We never come and say, Lord, you'd better do this or you're not going to hear from me for a while. The created never comes and makes demands of the creator. But we come with humility and we can be persistent like the widow who knocked at the door of a judge and wouldn't quit. We're called to be the most persistent, nagging people in the world. Feel free to nag God. But we come with humility. And we say, Lord, I don't deserve even a crumb. <laughs> but if you've got a crumb for me, I'll take it. I don't deserve even a crumb. But Lord, I'll take whatever crumb you give me. Lord, I'm not worthy of your help. I blow it, I fall short. But I know you love me. I know you love me. And Lord Jesus, please help me. And we come in humility, making requests to God. To lead to our fourth point. And it's simply this. Even the tiniest crumb of God's mercy and grace and kindness and healing is a feast. Think of fair food. Even the tiniest crumb or morsel of God's kindness, tender mercy, grace, healing and love can be like the biggest feast we've ever had. Biggest feast we ever had. That's the way God operates, isn't it? That's the way God operates. To lead to our fifth and final point, and it's simply this. As we feed, and we hope even perhaps become fat, on the crumbs To become feasts that fall from the table of God's mercy and love. We can go out and invite others to the banquet. 
others to the meal, others to the table, others to his healing. Brings us all the way back to my little bit of extra introduction. This mother, in a sense, was the agent for her daughter. And this man's friends were his agents, bringing the healing of Jesus to them. Bringing the healing of Jesus to them. By the way, as a side note, I hope you freshly experience the healing of Jesus tonight as you partake in this meal and freshly claim the love of Jesus and his forgiveness and his grace as you partake in the bread and the wine and the body and blood of Christ. And so tonight, may we be reminded that we can bring our burdens to the Lord as we do so. We can interact with God on a very personal level. And sometimes he can draw out our faith. Uh, as we do so, we can come with humility. And we can know whatever tender mercies he has for us can become a banquet. And may we invite others to that banquet of healing in Jesus Christ. All as we trust in him as our Savior and Lord. Lord, we come to you tonight. We thank you for your word. We just thank you for this passage of Mark that on one level is short and another level is so deep. May we always cast our burdens on you, knowing that you care for us. And then, Lord Jesus, may the tiniest bit, the tiniest morsels of your grace and love and healing that we receive become feasts for our souls that give us just what we need to make it until tomorrow. And then the crumb or morsel tomorrow, what we need for the next day. Just minister in all these ways, Lord Jesus, as we trust in you as our Savior and Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. We love you this evening and we pray tonight for those who are sick and hurting. Uh, surround them with your healing touch. We pray for Teresa Egbers, Connie Peterson, Arlene Carper, Regina Culbertson, Tim Dane, Larry Starman, John Mean, Lauren Sigmund, Barbara Ashton, Janice Johnson, Lori Konarski, Paul Anderson, Haley Wirth, Denise Hall Salzbrenner, Landon Johnson, Jane Stuckey, Jackie Kirkpatrick, Bill Johnson, Suzanne Johnson, Bill Dix, Dolores Nielsen, Tony Koschel, Stacy Long, Lincoln Noble Hangman. Uh, Heavenly Father, surround them all with your healing touch. Uh, we pray for our servicemen and women, bring them home safely. Uh, minister in the lives of our rescue workers and law enforcement officers, keep them safe also. Uh, be with our shut ins and uh, bless our youth ministry. We pray all these things in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. And just a note, before we partake in our communion service, uh, I want to thank Rachel for handing out uh, the prepackaged disposable cups and wafers if you'd like to use those. If you would, during the service, feel free to do that at, at any time God leads you. Otherwise, you're welcome to come forward and receive communion in the traditional way. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is indeed right and salutary that at all times and in all places we should offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death from the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so of the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. 
Again after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And let us join together in praying our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of those whom you have fed with one heavenly food. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.